because I need to give a thanks just to start things off for uh, Casey here and uh, his partner Jasmine Henderson who helped a bunch with collecting a lot of these samples which I'll touch upon at the end and a lot of this work work was done out on Catalina so okay uh, before I go too much into what the science subject is I thought I'd give a very brief impromptu introduction to myself uh, like Katie was saying, my name is Yuvin Rao. I was actually born in Nepal. And the reason I like to start at the roots here is because it's quite perplexing how I ended up studying the ocean, starting out in a country that's absolutely landlocked. So if you're looking at any of these pictures here, you might notice that there's beautiful scenery and there's tons and tons of cool places to explore. But like I'm saying, it's mostly just mountain ranges, actually home to some of the tallest mountain ranges in the world. And so from there, I moved to the States at about nine years old. And believe it or not, it was a little bit of a culture shock, but I moved to North Texas. So Arlington near Dallas, which I'm sure you guys have heard of Dallas at least. Um, and that's kind of where I grew up. So that's where I went to school and did elementary, middle, high school. And then uh, ironically enough, I also did my undergraduate at Texas A&M University. And it's interesting, but I did a, a wide variety of things when I was in my undergrad. I worked at different jobs as mentor for incoming first generation students as well, figuring things out myself as I was moving through it. Um, and my bachelor started out in biology where I was initially doing pre-med. And then I picked up geology because I had this strong passion for traveling and love for the outdoors. And these are just some really picturesque uh, images of places around the U.S. which I got to go for field work when I was doing my geology degree. Again, the reason I'm throwing this out there is absolutely unrelated to the ocean. <laughs> and it wasn't until my last semester when I was doing a minor in oceanography where I had experience learning in a way that I hadn't done before, even though everything leading up to that moment had always just been being immersed in school. I had never been as engaged as I was without like with minimal effort let's just say that like I could actually sit through class and not even worry about my mind wandering and so that's kind of where I first had my interaction with the ocean it wasn't as uh, poetic as some of other people's first interaction with the ocean might have been where you know you go boogie boarding or snorkeling or tide pooling but that then propelled me to a really really cool place and which was well, I had to pick a university for graduate studies. And the reason, one of the many reasons for why I picked USC, and this will make sense to a lot of you guys, if you ever go out to the island, for those of you that have already been out there, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I had this new spark and interest for exploring the ocean. And I kept thinking to myself, well, what better place to be at for five plus years than California? And then when we came out for a visit, they actually took us out to Wrigley. And we visited the Wrigley Marine Science Center, which is this what this aerial shot is showing here. And they just threw it out there like, you know, there's an opportunity to conduct research at Wrigley, maybe during your summers or whatever, through the Wrigley Fellowship Program. Um, and that had me hooked, hook, line, and sinker. I was like, all right, I'm coming here, and then we'll see how I get to explore the ocean. And I think I got more than what I might have signed up for, actually, because the Wrigley Marine Science Center ended up serving as my second home. I moved to LA about five years ago now, moved here in 2015, and I've spent four consecutive summers there. And um, the cumulative time spent on the island has been a year and probably even more because I, as my research unfolded, I ended up coming out during the um, fall and spring semesters as well to do some research on the side. And again, these are just some pictures from the island. It's not just us that are residents out there. You also have the infamous bison that you know, stumble into campus, campus and hang out with us there for a while. And it's a really, really beautiful place, not just to do research, but to be inspired by nature in general. So again, uh, definitely recommend being able to explore, especially since most of you guys are at USC or if not affiliated with USC to some extent, you got to check it out. All right. Um, so while I was here, it actually has ended up serving as my research platform. Like I said, I'm in my fifth year of my PhD here at USC. I work in Duck and Cones Lab. And you can probably just see the key word, if we were to do a word cloud on this, is nitrogen. So we study the global marine nitrogen cycle, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But some of the projects that spun out of being at Wrigley was uh, one that ended up being the main thrust of my PhD thesis, which is just looking at nitrogen fixation associated with seaweed. And then that got me interested into looking at macroalgal microbiomes. And uh, another program uh, sponsored through 
Wrigley is the San Pedro Ocean time series. At some point or another, you will interact with that. Um, Diane is involved with that as well. And we're looking at new versus regenerated primary production. And then just being able to make connections and networks uh, or networking out on the island. Because when you're out there, you're going to end up really getting to know the people that are surrounding you that are doing their own research or coming out for various day trips or whatever. So um, the Kelp Biofuels Project, which I'm sure, again, Diane will introduce, if not, sh if she hasn't already introduced it, got to end up working a little bit on that as well. And then the topic of today's talk, which I'll get into a little bit here, benthic nitrogen fixation is where I'm at right now in my whole journey that has been sponsored largely by Wrigley. And so uh, this, I feel like, is a good point to really thank the Wrigley Institute Graduate Summer Fellowship, as well as the Victoria J. Burdick's Graduate Fellowship which I've been fortunate to receive the past you know, four summers or so. That's what allowed me to be on the island and get to do a lot of fun activities and work with some really good um, undergraduate students from all over the world. Um, so these are just some pictures of me interacting with my REUs. Actually, this is from the first summer to this was the last one. And this summer would have also been just like the last four, but it's actually my first summer off of Catalina. So I'm enjoying the June gloom out on the mainland for the first time. You know. So, okay, you've heard a lot like about nitrogen, just me tossing it around, that's what our lab focuses on. I thought it'd be good to start. Why is it important? Oh, well, nitrogen is an important constituent of many of life's building blocks. So things that you've learned in class or heard the terminology, RNA, DNA, just any, any of the nucleic acids constitute nitrogen, also amino acids, protein, et cetera. And so all living organisms from your smallest living things like bacteria, archaea, to the largest organisms like blue whales, you know, giant redwood trees, et cetera. Every, every living thing on planet Earth as we know it needs nitrogen. Um, ironically enough though, it's often considered a main major limiting nutrient for a lot of these different organisms. Um, and this is rather perplexing if you think about it because uh, contrary to what most people think about when we say, you know, our atmosphere, our air, a lot of people think immediately to oxygen because that's what we need to breathe, whatnot. But the majority of the atmosphere is actually dinitrogen gas. So it's very much everywhere around us, yet how is it a limiting nutrient? So that's a good question if you're thinking that. Um, it's because the, the global nitrogen cycle is actually quite complex and there's lots of moving parts. Um, as you can see in this depiction here, I'm not going to get into every single interaction because that would be, first of all, way outside the scope of what we're trying to do here. And also, I would end up lecturing for hours on it. And we all, we're trying to keep it short, 15 minutes, right? So uh, I'm going to instead focus on biological nitrogen fixation, which is this arrow right here, the nit dinitrogen gas in the atmosphere um, being fixed by bacteria. So biological nitrogen fixation, or BNF here, as it's abbreviated, it's carried out by specialized microbes, as I mentioned earlier, bacteria and archaea that are referred to as diazotropes. And if you actually look at the name here, don't be scared of a fancy term, et cetera. Di just means two, azo means nitrogen, and troph just refers to food or nourishment. So if you were to put all that together, it just means two nitrogen atoms being utilized as some sort of food or nourishment. And if that's what you can take away from this talk, I will be very happy because I love nitrogen fixation. This is what my primary focus has been for the past couple of years. So this is the conversion of dinitrogen gas into a biologically available form of nitrogen. And the reason it's important here that I say biologically available is because even though it's constituting 78% of the atmosphere, it's inaccessible to most of us living organisms. The only things that can catalyze that uh, conversion from dinitrogen gas into organic nitrogen, as depicted here, are again the specialized microbes, diazotrophs or nitrogen fixers, okay? So that explains at least a portion of my title, nitrogen fixation. The other part is the sea floor. So you may be wondering, well, why the sea floor? I'm sure you guys have all seen beautiful images of Earth from uh, space. And if you recall, hopefully blue is the one thing that you recall from those images. And if you look at just this map at the bottom here, even when we draw it in a two-dimensional surface, like continents are disproportionately drawn on there to make it look easy to navigate for you know, mapping purposes. But about 71% of the Earth's surface is actually consumed by the ocean. So uh, Earth actually should be more appropriately be called ocean. Um, so underneath this immense body of water, 
there is the sea floor. And I feel like that's often an overlooked aspect when we talk about the, the vastness of the ocean, if you will. And what's crazy is most of that ocean sea floor or uh, ocean floor is largely unexplored, but from what we have explored so far, we're finding it to be teeming, teeming with life. Um, and here's actually a really cool um, image that shows it's not just like this flat, homogenous uh, sea floor. There's actually diverse topography. And just like you would have mountain ranges and canyons and trenches, et cetera, on, on the terrestrial continents, as you guys know and maybe have explored, the sea floor is no different. It has all these places. And the more we're able to go and explore these places, we're starting to, again, find that there's life everywhere. Uh, there's one in particular that is, should be of interest for you guys is referred to as the abyssal zone, which includes like the abyssal plains. These cover about 85% of the sea floor. And if you notice here, the abyssal plains that's depicted here is this, that's where it is a little bit more just sediment covered. There's not as much diverse topography. And if you are looking at the rest of this image, you may think, oh, look, the continental shelves here kind of look similar to that. And because they cover such a vast amount, um, my research is, or an aspect of my research is also wanting to look at the continental shelf. And the other reason, uh, don't get me wrong, I would also love to go out and explore these trenches and go on some submersible dives or go look at submarine canyons. But the accessibility of these places is quite far. It's under an immense body of water. So that means um, you're going down past depths of four kilometers. So the pressure is going to be really, really high and it's gonna be cold and dark. So getting down there takes a lot of resources. But the continental shelf, like the Catalina Harbor, is very easily accessible, especially with Wrigley Marine Science Center in driving distance. And as some of these pictures depicted here show, that's where we collected some of the sediments. And if you're looking or thinking about how did I go about collecting those sediments, it was actually not much sophisticated technology involved at all. There's a bucket and a shovel and my buddy Casey would go out there and then we were also pushing these sediment cores in. And that's how we're collecting the sediment samples. Um, so the other working site on Catalina that I have used before is Big Fisherman's Cove, which is located right down the waterfront uh, off of where the Wrigley Marine Science Center is. And this one is a little bit more sophisticated in the sense that we're still using uh, buckets and shovels to collect the sediments or using these sediment cores that you can see Casey and Jasmine pushing and using a mallet to hammer into the sea floor there. But obviously you're gonna to need to be able to be submerged underwater for longer periods of time than what I can do just free diving. So they're scuba certified. And so they collected all these different um, buckets and buckets of samples for me. And then we bring it back up to the dock. It's not a bad place to be shifting through mud as like a, a portion of my research. And so that those were the two sites. And um, that's kind of where I was planning on continuing on some of this research. But obviously, as you guys are well aware, due to some unexpected changes um, with COVID, et cetera, we have not been carrying on with this research. And instead, what I've spent my summer doing is uh, analyzing some of the data, the preliminary data that I've already collected. So very briefly, again, this is outside the scope, so you don't need to fully understand this, but I'm using a method called the acetylene reduction assay, which uses a gas chromatograph. Uh, and you can see another one of our REUs here injecting samples into it. Those sediment samples that I collected from either Cat Harbor or Big Fisherman Coves were then aliquoted out into these cute little vials. And that's what we're filling with uh, acetylene gas. And this is an indirect way to measure nitrogenase activity. Nitrogenase is just the enzyme that is responsible for catalyzing that biological nitrogen fixation process I was explaining earlier. And then you get these plots at, as your outcome. And then from here, we can indirectly estimate nitrogen fixation rates. And so what I can give you guys right now is some preliminary data. Uh, actually, this is an, a published article. Some researchers also from Wrigley did work out on Cat Harbor prior to me starting this project ever, where they were um, looking at also nitrogen fixation rates in Catalina Harbor sediments, but they were looking at uh, burrow, um, burrowed sediments by these uh, shrimp that are, you find them everywhere. So it's quite exciting. And I, I love this picture that they had in the paper. So all these results are pulled from their paper. And if anyone's interested, feel free to go read it later. But the main point that I wanted to get across was that they were able to measure nitrogen fixation rates in the sediments in Catalina Harbor. And one of the things that they had found in the paper was near the burrow opening, 
you can see the rates are much, much higher than in other places. And then if you're looking at this graph over to the, or this figure to the right, again, this is showing a depth profile. So as you go down deeper into the sediments, um, so if you were to go down deeper like this way, you see again, higher rates and it's a broken axis. So you're actually seeing much higher rates closer to the opening than you see in the middle of the burrows. And so uh, my question was, well, first of all, can I even replicate some of the findings that they had made in this study? And so that's what I've been doing this summer. And long story short, yes, we were also able to measure similar rates for Catalina Arbor sediments as the ones reported by um, the article that I just showed you in the slide before. And this was, again, the work that we'd done, I think, about a summer and a half ago now. So, you know, the data hadn't been analyzed. So actually, this ended up being, it worked out for me, at least. And then, uh, because I told you guys, we're also collecting sediments from Big Fisherman Cove. We also have the first nitrogen fixation rates that we measured from that area. And what we're seeing there is that the rates are slightly higher than Catalina Harbor sediments. And so that has led me to think why. And one of the things that was being, or that I was planning on and, and carrying out this summer was uh, if anyone has ever been around the cove, you can vouch that there's a much, much uh, more vibrant and interesting ecosystem to look at because it's, there's a lot of uh, kelp forests and other understory macroalgae all over the cove. And so the question, my main question was, well, would you have um, nitrogen fixing um, microbes be stimulated by all that macroalgae that would fall down onto their habitat on the seafloor? And we actually had done some of these incubations. I'm working up that data right now. So stay tuned. We'll figure out soon enough whether that is true or not. And so the future direction now I'm also interested in a more larger scope, how does uh, macroalgal burial in sediments change things for other microbial communities? Um, and so we are planning on trying to do much more of that work once researchers are, uh, research is more accessible out on the island. But that's kind of how I've been spending my summer. And so I wanna thank you guys for your attention and open up the floor for any questions that you may have. And it can be about anything because I feel like I've touched upon many different parts of not just the research, but how I ended up here presenting in front of you.